All four Gospels tell the story of Christ's resurrection, but today we'll hear Luke's version, a reading from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. Listen for God's word today. On the first day of the week at early dawn, the women came to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they stood about perplexed over this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. And the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And they remembered these words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to the rest. And now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But their words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Peter got up and ran to the tomb, and stooping in, he saw that the linen cloths were by themselves. And then he too went home, amazed at what has happened. Friend, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, once more, come into this space. Change a building into a church. Change individuals into your body. And change the words I would offer into your words of hope. For you are with us, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The New York Times Book Review recently interviewed the African-American literary critic, a woman named Margot Jefferson. And as is their practice, they began by asking her, what books are on your nightstand? And so she listed off several titles, and then she said, I choose which to read by asking myself, can I risk having this in my dreams? You know that feeling, you're lying in bed, you're, you're moving towards sleep, but your mind continues to process the events of the day, the things you most recently saw or imagined, the conversations that you had from earlier, a TV show you might have watched, or an article or something that you saw on a final scroll on your phone before turning off the light. And that's where Margot Jefferson's question rings true. Sometimes, The day's activities and our bedtime reading prompts us to ask the question, can I risk having this in my dreams tonight? But events may overwhelm us, and the questions that flood our minds may well keep us from finding sleep. At some point of the evening of that very first Easter, Mary Magdalene tried to close her eyes to sleep. But I imagine that her mind was still racing, wide awake, trying to process what she'd seen earlier that morning. She had not gone to the cemetery expecting to see an empty tomb. She'd gone because her devotion to Jesus required her, prompted her, to want to complete the necessary burial arrangements that were left incomplete on Friday. But now, she couldn't unsee what she had seen. The stone rolled away, no body on the rock slab inside, burial cloths left in a pile, and then two angels standing there asking her point blank, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And perhaps most troubling of all was not the sight of the empty tomb. Most unsettling, and in many ways most remarkable, was the fact that God had placed the responsibility of telling others about this empty tomb squarely on her shoulders. It's not like God doesn't have an entire arsenal of natural wonders at God's disposal that God could have used to announce Jesus' resurrection. I mean, goodness knows. Noah had his rainbow, Moses had a parted sea, Jonah had a whale, Balaam had a talking ass, 
And Joshua literally made the sun stand still until the end of the Battle of Gibeon. Surely there had to be other options available for heavenly pyrotechnics to announce to the world that Jesus was alive. But no. According to Luke's Gospel, the entire responsibility for telling the resurrection story was assigned to a group of women, struck by wonder by what they'd seen, and then to the Apostle Peter, who was filled with amazement after visiting the empty tomb for himself. Now, to be honest, the first time Mary tried to tell someone about what she'd seen, her friends didn't believe her. I don't know if they laughed or stared or shook their heads in disbelief, but Scripture says point blank that her words seemed to them like an idle tale, and she was not believed. So it wasn't quite an auspicious start to this new chapter in the history of the world. And even when Peter ran to the tomb, Scripture doesn't say that he then came to believe the women's story of the resurrection. It only says he was filled with amazement. Well, amazement is not faith. And yet somehow all of this was God's plan for sharing the greatest news of all time. So on this Easter, put yourself in Mary Magdalene's sandals for a moment. Imagine that you are one of the first witnesses of the empty tomb, that to you has been entrusted the task of sharing this news, this tale of wonder and amazement, and that God's entire plan is dependent on you, which it actually is, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So the question is, how do you make sense of that as you lie there in your bed, knowing that sleep is impossible until you can sort out this Easter responsibility. So I suggest it takes three things, a bit of philosophy, a bit of poetry, and Clark Kent's glasses. I'll explain. Philosophers spend all of their time pondering the big questions of life and of death. And Jesus' resurrection from the dead is one of the all-time big questions. It's a question, though, that is ultimately unanswerable because it has no parallel. It cannot be absolutely proven. It's a question designed to be accepted by faith. A very wise 20th century philosopher named Hannah Arendt insisted that all of us need unanswerable questions. She said, if we ever lose our ability to grapple with unanswerable questions, then we will also lose the ability to answer the answerable questions, the types of questions that we have to deal with and respond to in order to live in a modern society. Now, Mary Magdalene, Peter, and the others were confronted with an unanswerable question that now literally affected every other question, every other topic of conversation they would ever have from that day forth. And because of that one big question, that tale of resurrection wonder, everything else about life was seen in a brand new light. And that was true for them, and it remains true for us. Now, those last couple sentences sounded a little bit poetic, which is also totally appropriate for Easter. If philosophers want us to think deeper, poets want us to look deeper. Poets want us to be moved by the sheer wonder and the mystery of life itself. There's a very wise Jewish rabbi and poet named Abraham Heschel. And Heschel wants us to be filled daily with a sense of awe, that sense that there is something bigger than us at work in the world around us, that life is marked by a transcendence, a holy mystery. A rational scientist can't get you to believe in resurrection, but a poet can. What a poet does is places the Easter story in your outstretched hands and tells you hold on to this story lovingly, gently, because it's more than history and it's more than reason. 
It's a sacred memory. It's a glimpse into the very heart of God. And it unlocks much of what life is truly about. And in that unlocking of that mystery, in receiving that gift, we are truly set free. Which now leads me to Clark Kent's glasses. If you're a fan of Marvel or DC comics and movies, you know there are now literally scores of superheroes in these fantasy worlds. But one of the oldest superheroes is, of course, Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet, stronger than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. That guy, you know. Now, perhaps the most amazing part of Superman is that he doesn't hide his true identity behind a mask like Batman or Spider-Man or Wolverine. Nope, he simply puts on a pair of regular old black frame glasses and he becomes Clark Kent, a mild manner newspaper reporter. It's such a simple thing and yet those glasses seem to make all the difference in the world. You put on glasses, you become Clark Kent. You take them off and you're suddenly Superman with whom all things are possible. The Christian writer John Pavlovich used this analogy of Clark Kent's glasses to remind us that what separates us from the life we have and the life we could have is often a line so narrow that we'd be shocked if we realized it. As he put it, most of us are only one decision away from completely rewriting our personal narrative. One conversation, one relationship, one moment of insight and fresh clarity, and suddenly an entirely new life opens up before us. The line that Mary Magdalene walked on Easter morning and then stepped over was quite narrow. On one side was a cemetery and burial spices, but on the other side was an open doorway to an empty tomb. And it was the same for Simon Peter. On one side of the line was a scared disciple, unsure and questioning. And on the other side was a man who soon was running back to be with his friends in the upper room, filled with amazement. Glasses on, glasses off. As simple as that. And everything changed. Deep philosophy questions awesome poetic wonder, plus small steps that change our lives forever. All of that is part of what it means to be a people of Easter faith. Because in so many ways, Easter boils down to those simple words the angel said to Mary Magdalene at the tomb. Just remember what Jesus told you and stop looking for the living among the dead. Stop looking for life among deadly bigotries and closed-minded prejudice, among soul-crushing cynicism and fear. Stop looking for life among policies of militarism and war, among capital punishment and oppression, among laws that take away voting rights that would punish transgender athletes and families, that would insist women have no say about the care of their own bodies. Stop looking in places that are dead and then stop for a moment and simply ask the question, does this choice before me, does this law, does this action of mine bring life or bring death? Is it another sad stroll in the cemetery of the dead? Or is it part of a joyful dash down the road of resurrection life? Which brings us all full circle to Mary Magdalene, to Peter, to you and me and why God has incredibly put the full weight of telling the Easter story on our shoulders. The resurrection of Christ was never meant to be something that overwhelms us, something that by heavenly pyrotechnics forces us to believe and thereby makes us less than we truly might be. The resurrection of Christ is designed to make us more than we could have ever imagined, to energize us to ponder the unanswerable so that we will approximate that which is answerable.
to inspire us to see glimpses of the holy even in the mundane moments of our daily lives, and then to step over that thin line from Clark Kent to Superman, from cowering disciple to gospel proclaimer, no longer looking for things in the places of death, but rejoicing always in the ways of resurrection life. And God knows that you're up to this task, which is why you've been chosen to tell these tales of wonder and amazement in a hurting world that's longing for good news. So what's on your nightstand? What stories will you risk having in your dreams tonight and tomorrow? The story of Christ's resurrection is worth a lifetime's pondering and a lifetime's proclamation. So friends, hear again the Easter good news of Jesus Christ. Tomb thou shalt not hold him longer. Death is strong, but life is stronger. Stronger than the dark, the light. Stronger than the wrong, the right. Faith and hope triumphant say, Christ arose on Easter day. Hallelujah. Amen.